get on for green. Do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and then we will go right to our presentation. I call a meeting to order. Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, I guess you know who's here? I do. Correct? Okay. Uh, I don't believe we're going to go off our agenda a little bit. We're going to have we have a presentation, okay. guest speaker Lisa Calvo, uh, the program coordinator and marine scientist running the Haskin Shellfish Research Lab for Rutgers. And okay. go okay. for it. You're okay. good. You're good. There we go. Better. Yes. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try and stand up. Well, I don't know, I'll sit down. Um, so thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. A uh, little correction, I have recently retired from Rutgers. Um, so I am here representing the New Jersey Aquaculture Association. Um, a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm an oyster farmer. I own Sweet Amalia Oyster Farm and uh, Sweet Amalia Market and Kitchen, which is located in Newfield. Um, we do uh, farm-raised oysters. They're grown here in Cape May County in the Lower Delaware Bay in Green Creek. Uh, I do direct delivery to restaurants in Philadelphia and along the Jersey Shore and then have this new retail market and restaurant um, uh, that I have uh, partners with. Um, so I came to oyster farming through a long career in marine science, uh, cut my teeth early on um, at the Rutgers Haskin Shellfish Research Laboratory, got hooked on shellfish and shellfish research, worked on shellfish diseases and pathology, got my master's degree down at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and worked on the Chesapeake for 16 years, all related to oyster shellfish research, um, disease dynamics and ecology, oyster restoration, um, genetics and breeding of oysters, oyster aquaculture, and sort of that was my segue into oyster farming, which started out as a little side hustle um, and then just became uh, passion and love. And uh, as the farm grew, uh, you know, I could no longer handle both the academic world and the business world uh, without, uh, you know, without working 24-7. Um, so I am now uh, oyster farming. So what I thought I would do today, um, Justine invited me to uh, speak about the ecological value of oyster farming, but I thought it might be beneficial to go ahead and present a little overview of oyster farming in New Jersey, where we're at, um, and, then, and then talk about um, some of the, the methodology, how farms operate and where they're located, and, and then get into the, the green aspect and the ecological benefits of oyster farming. Um, so I'm pretty casual, uh, informal speaker. If you have questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, also comfortable, um, you know, answering questions toward the end. Yes. I have a degree in biology from Rutgers. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my degree is from University of Delaware, so. Um, I'm, but I did spend a lot of time working at Rutgers, and, and most recently I worked in the extension world where I was really helping to promote uh, and advance uh, shellfish aquaculture in the state. Um, so extension is like a mixed bag. It includes policy, it includes technical aspects, you know, education and all kind of things. So um, anyway, this is a little awkward. I'm gonna have to kind of scroll like through a PDF here. But I, I'm a big uh, kind of foodie uh, uh, among other aspects, uh, cultural, marine culture of oyster farming. Uh, I really love oysters. I love eating them. And I love sharing them. And uh, I have this cookbook from this uh, chef named Barton Seaver, and he's a big sustainability kind of advocate. Um, his cookbook is called For Cotton Country. 
And I love this, I love this quote. He says, eating farmed oysters is your patriotic duty. <laughs> they are not just sustainable. They actually help restore depleted ecosystems. Mm. So we'll elaborate on that a little bit as we move through um, the story here. But if you have a chance to interact with uh, Barton Siever through his cookbook or his presentations, he's pretty cool and um, interesting fellow. So um, recently during the pandemic, we developed this guide I'm gonna leave copies of. Um, it was um, voluntary um, promotional material that farmers could participate in, shellfish farmers, clam farmers, oyster farmers. And inside is a map of um, where some of the participants are located. We had about 31 participants. And uh, along the shore, you can see we have farms located from the northern part of the Barnegat Bay in Manilokan, down along the Atlantic coast and the back coastal bays, and up into the Delaware Bay in both Cape May County and Cumberland County, New Jersey. So, um, you know, you're welcome to take a stack of these and just distribute them to others and share them. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I like it as just a visual, so you can see the scope of where farms are located. The farms uh, occur on shellfish leases, which have been developed through the years for some for centuries, um, where the state has carved up um, plots out in open waters, public waters, where shellfish cultivation can happen. And then individuals will lease these bottom areas from the state and um, the, the distribution of those and the leasing is controlled by independent shell fisheries councils, which work in, in, in uh, collaboration with state officials. And those councils are industry uh, people, so they're oyster fishermen, clam fishermen, clam farmers, oyster farmers, that uh, control yay, nay on the leasing. Once you get your lease, there's a whole suite of permits that are essential uh, to operate a farm that includes uh, national permits with Army Corps of Engineers, nationwide permit 48, um, and um, land use, tide lands, uh, Department of Agriculture, Bureau of Marine Water Monitoring, all have permits related to shellfish farming in the state. So it's not like, you know, it's not like willy nilly, you really have to have a plan you have to get proper permissions, and in that process is um, public review, public comment um, through, um, you know, letters are sent to individuals in adjacent areas that have property, own property, and, um, uh oh. Hmm. Oh, bummer. It'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> let's see oh um, that's unfortunate let's see <laughs> oh, I'm sorry <laughs> he said let's see not connected Bluetooth not connected I have no idea it's the just talking about this it is the connection between the screen and the computer. I don't know. Well, I, um, anybody techie here that wants to take a stab at this? Just, I can, I can talk through it, no problem at all. Take, take all the plugs and the Bluetooth comes back for this one. Anybody got Aaron's number? I don't know. Are you no. are you a Windows person? Um, no. Oh, I probably do. Hold on. Add a Bluetooth. Show Bluetooth devices. Where do I? I don't think that's it. No, that's what mine does. <laughs> oh. If I leave it on too long, oh. it's bad. Should I have Aaron's. Ask Karen. Should I, are you going to? We're going to. I have uh, Mike. I have it. Mike. Can you do with this? She's. I will. Hi, Aaron. I hate to ask you to come down, but we have a no signal, and we're not sure how to get it back. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not more. Uh, on the projection, I, I on the projection <laughs> screen, so it says no signal. I'm afraid. 
You want to get Bud? <laughs> oh, okay. uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye bye. Ocean Festival. It's not hard. She said she's not, not sure she can fix it, but she's on her way. <laughs> it's fine. It'll be fine. Yeah. Some people are saying it's Harbor Fest, and I'm like, Bleh. <laughs> it's not Harbor Fest. Isn't that just a difference in name? No. It's, oh, it's really? A scale. It's oh. not. We're not closing the streets. It's oh, not like okay. That. Okay. It's a. It's more like Monarch Festival. Huh. A much okay. smaller mm -hmm. for this year. Yeah. You know, we'll we see. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> All right. I mean, I'm I'm happy. I can kind of keep talking, and yeah. you know, we'll we'll catch up on that. So I was talking about the permitting, right? So there's a lot of permitting and review, and you know, as oyster farmers and as the state um, develops policy around aquaculture and its growth, we have to appreciate all these other users in the space, be it wildlife, um, be it kayakers, commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen land owners their visual scape so there's a there's a lot of balancing act and newfield or, or new jersey's uh you know relatively highly populated a lot of um waterfront development and so it's it's tricky right the growth of aquaculture in the state right now we have uh maybe 30 oyster farms you know massachusetts has 400 rhode oh. island has 300 virginia has 400. Maine has, you know. Um, so we're relatively uh, small sector. Um, oyster farming started in contemporary oyster farming that I'm talking about today started in the late 1990s. Stu T Tweed, who is a Cape May um, legend, uh, you know, was working at Rutgers and with Cooperative Extension and brought Atlantic Capes Fisheries into the mix to develop the Cape May Salt Farm. And um, that was really the first farm and the pioneering oyster farm here in the state. Historically, if you go back, right, a century, fishermen were oyster farming. They were harvesting oysters from natural seed beds, moving them down bay to areas where they leased for planting, allowing them to fatten up and then harvesting them. That interaction and intervention in the oyster's life cycle classifies it as really aquaculture. So um, more on an extensive on bottom. Today what we're talking about is pretty much hatchery based and uh, involves gear in which the oysters are contained. So here in Cape May, um, probably you've taken a tour. If you haven't, you maybe should take a tour of the Aquaculture Innovation Center. Uh, which is the Rutgers University facility located on the Cape May Canal down by the ferry terminals. Everyone know the building I'm talking about. Uh, huge building, uh, scaled up for research, uh, aquaculture research, but also commercial production. And, and that is um, one of the very few oyster hatcheries in the state um, supporting the industry. So what happens is they'll produce baby oysters, which are then sold to oyster farmers to plant on their farms. Mm. And there are 50 hatcheries along the east coast of the United States and growing. Um, so if you're an oyster farmer, your production begins in a hatchery, um, which is a very controlled environment. The, the oysters are produced um, on filtered water, they're fed algal diets, carefully handled, temperatures very well controlled. Um, the other thing that's controlled is the source, the parent oyster that they're producing the babies from. So Doc Hal Haskin at Rutgers, after diseases struck the bay and decimated the oyster, wild oyster populations, he took survivors of that endemic event and he brought them into the laboratory and he started breeding them. So through selective breeding, he developed uh, oysters that were disease tolerant or resistant to the, the local diseases. So that was really the first thing that enabled oyster farming to develop, was having these special stocks, high performing in the face of disease. And um, you could then invest time and energy in growing these oysters for this 
period of time till they got to market size and, and know that they're not all gonna die from disease. Now it's not a, it's not a silver bullet. When they still get disease, some of them still die, but it's, it's manageable now. So oyster breeding is continuing at Rutgers University, at other universities, at, at uh, federal USDA centers. And breeding is looking at many different things. We're looking at, now we're looking at uh, tolerance to variable winter weather. We're looking at shell coloration, fast growth, um, other stressors, ocean acidification. So as aquaculture grows, we're trying to always put forward an oyster that will grow and adapt to those changes. So this isn't genetic modification at all. It's, it's classic selective breeding, just like you would breed a tomato or dogwood tree or corn that might be disease resistant or have special traits that you wanna put forward. And through the successive breeding generation after generation, you can select for that particular trait that you want. So do visit the hatchery. Um, so oyster farmers, typically, uh, if they have waterfront property, they might have a land-based nursery where it's kind of slightly controlled. You might have them in tanks with natural water running through. So the oysters are feeding on the phytoplankton and algae in that natural water, right? Um, the hatchery, they're culturing the algae they're feeding them. The next step is this move to raw water, natural water. So the cool thing about farming oysters is really there, there are no inputs into the production system other than the oysters and the gear that they're gonna be contained in. No antibiotics, no food additives, so it's a very natural uh, food production system. Uh, I'm trying to... Uh, Scroll through my slides here. Let's see if I can move up. All right, so I have pictures of hatcheries and baby oysters. You're doing fine. Um, so uh, I just bought oysters. My first batch of oyster seed, we call them seed, came in. They're two millimeters. I got them from Maine, uh, hatchery in Maine last week. Typically, when you're an oyster farmer, you'll try to order place orders at different hatcheries because hatcheries often have failures and if you have all your eggs in one basket and they don't produce that year, you're, you're stuck without seed. We'll place orders for seed back in, like in December for what we wanna grow. And then we'll get them throughout, throughout the summer. I don't have a, a land-based system because I don't have waterfront property where I could set that type of system up. So I'm putting these little tiny, they look like little specks of sand, uh, you know, out into the environment in containers with a very fine mesh it looks like a little bit smaller than window screen um, to contain these little tiny baby animals. And then, um, you know, carefully manage them in, in the field. Um, so those cages are secured. My farm is located, um, does, does everyone know where the Rutgers University Cape Shore Laboratory is in Green Creek? It's right on the Bay Shore. It's been there since 1927, Center of Research. The, uh, the main research that happens there now is um, the breeding program. Um, but I'm right out in front of that. And that area is really special uh, and it's intertidal. So at low tide, tide ebbs out. Um, you can walk out in shallow water for like a half a mile. It's gonna be, uh, you know, alternating sandbars and shallow sloughs are exposed at low tide. So we can walk off the beach at low tide, see our oysters. They're in cages and baskets secured to racks that are sit like 12, 15 inches up off the bottom. And we work during the low tide. At high tide, there'll be five feet of water over those racks. So the oysters are well adapted to uh, handle this time in air. They're exposed to air. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's a very special system. There's maybe a six mile stretch in that southern portion of the bay from Reeds Beach to the villas maybe a little bit further south, where you see these extensive sand flats. Um, this method is called rack and bag culture. It's a similar type of production to what you might find in France, uh, Ireland, Australia. Um, some systems use that. And it's special for these areas that are very, very shallow that you can access at low tide and, and work the farms. Um, so 
Oyster farming here in New Jersey started in that area on the Cape Shore Flats. Presently, there are maybe eight, nine farmers that work those flats and have farms in that area. The growth in the expansion of the industry has primarily been on Atlantic coastal bays. And Barnegat Bay, uh, we have some farms, Ludlam Bay, um, back behind uh, Summers Point area, there are farms. And so those areas are not gonna have this particular shallow biogeography or uh, physical geography. They're gonna have uh, typically shallow water um, where you can use floating cages or you can use bottom cages that you're gonna access, you're gonna get out to your farm with a, with a small uh, skiff or boat and, and work, work those cages. Uh, in the last five years, Atlantic Cape Fisheries, which has, you know, big uh, history with working big vessels and equipment, they have moved some or, or started farming operations up in the Delaware Bay in, in water that can be 12 to 20 feet deep. And they have these very robust, big cages. They use 70 foot vessels to tend those cages. They have crew and um, it's allowing expansion up the bay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Try to keep me around. Thank you. Disconnection again. It's just click that and then click connect again. And okay. Click keep my name and call. Okay. But and that I should get me back. I think I did restart. Or I'm sorry. It looked like it needed an update. And I was on. Oh, okay. And everything. So fingers crossed. Okay. But so great. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to bother you. No, I wish I was more bye, tech savvy bye, bye, here. Bye, bye. Thanks, Sarah. You're welcome. Aaron, you're our hero. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Know you. Anything happens again. All right, we'll try and get through it quick. Um, so uh, the top of this slide is a is a view of the inside of the Aquaculture Innovation Center in Cape May. Again, you know, call them up, schedule a tour. It's very, very cool. Um, they're in the middle of their season this year. They're they're producing a number of different species: oysters, clams, surf clams, scallops. Uh, the bottom left is a picture of a oyster larvae. So when they start their life cycle from the fertilized egg, they'll have a swimming uh, life stage where they they'll they have um, they can move around in the water column. That lasts about three weeks, and they'll settle down. They'll metamorphose, and they'll get that hard shell. At that point, they don't move anymore. And the the cool thing, if they're if they're settling out in the wild they're gluing themselves down to a surface. So typically it's another oyster, they're creating an oyster reef attached to one another, um, and then that's where they live for their life, right? In the hatcheries, we actually trick them to settle as individuals so that we can better control how they look as we grow them in, on the farms. And they'll use like very uh, tiny, tiny micro culch, little specks of sand that are microscopic that give the oysters a surface to settle to or they'll use like a shot of epinephrine that somehow just wakes them up and tells them to, to do their thing. <laughs> um, so this size is an ideal planting size after a little bit of nursery time. They're like a little bit smaller than a dime. Um, the two millimeters are, are much smaller. Nursery systems can look a lot of different ways. They can be like these shallow raceways that have raw water running through. They can be these um, cylinders that are called upwellers that have screens on the bottom that contain the tiny, tiny <coughs> animals. And again, it's you're trying to pass through as much water because the water contains the food that they're eating, right? So you wanna keep water flow. Atlantic Capes Fisheries, that's a picture of a nursery system that they have that sits on the water on a dock. Um, so it's up on the Morris River and there's a big paddle wheel system that actually um, pulls the water through the system and passes it by the oysters. And then there's just like very basic, put them in a mesh bag and <laughs> put them out in the field um, methodologies. But you can see that top left image is about how the seed I got uh, <laughs> last week looked. So, I, you know, I won't, it won't all survive. I'll, I'll lose a bit of it, but you kind of include that in your planning. So planting from the nursery, they'll go into some type of container. A lot of farms use these um, rectangular mesh bags and the mesh bags come in different mesh sizes. So as the oysters grow, you might start out with 20,000 animals in a cage, in a basket, one of those bags, 
and then you'll, as they grow, you split them out and you move them up to the next mesh size. Again, water flow, water flow, water <coughs> flow. You wanna, you wanna optimize how much flow they're getting. So here's a picture of the Cape Shore Laboratory at high tide on the top. You can see water lapping up to the beach. At low tide, you see these intertidal sandbars and you can see the farms um, poking up there. And um, we'll scroll through. So here's a closer image of some larger oysters on racks. And again, this is called rack and bag uh, oyster farming. Okay, uh, more contemporary to the left, we have the deep water cages uh, Atlantic Capes is using with these large 70 foot tending vessels. We have floating cages. This is a site up in Barney, Barnegat Bay where there are those same bags that you saw, but you attach floats to them. Um, so they'll have them on floating lines. You can pull up a boat. And then this is Barnegat Bay, a really beautiful site <laughs> just below, uh, right, right at Cape, at the uh, lighthouse there, at Cape May, uh, Barnegat Light. Um, and then some bottom cages. And some farms will, you know, they'll use different methods. They might finish with floating systems, you know, or finish with bottom cages. Every farmer is going to have their particular needs of their site. What kind of supporting equipment and infrastructure they have will, will um, influence how they farm. Um, and then you can, you can grow oysters side by side in the same spot and make them look entirely different. You can shape, you know, oysters on your farm that look three different ways and you can sell them as different varieties. You can grow them, you can sell them at two and a half inches, you can sell them at four inches. So a lot of times farms will like different size, they'll call them different brands uh, or they'll have different locations. Um, for instance, Atlantic Capes Fisheries right now, they sell Cape May salts, they sell Elder Points and Stormy Bays. So, and, and they all look different based on the husbandry and, and the way they're being grown. So uh, it's not like a one size fits all type thing. It's very unique. Um, your permits will reflect what you're planning to do. And if you're changing that, you'll have to, you know, revise your permits. Most farms are, I mean, it's not a lot of acreage. You can, you can grow like a quarter of an acre, you can grow just about a million oysters, um, you know. So it, it, it doesn't take a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of area. Um, I really don't know how much acreage there is, you know, down at the Cape Shore. I think there's maybe if you draw, you know, rectangular boxes around where the gear is actually located, it's maybe combined 10 acres. Um, so relatively small footprint. But no matter what type of, of farming, where you are, it's intensive labor that you're putting into growing those animals, and especially when you're targeting a high quality half shell market. Um, down on the lower bay, our problem are these little tiny mud worms that will foul on the oysters and they, they build up tubes of mud and they can smother your stock in three days time. Ooh. So we bring um, power washers out, uh, trash pumps that we just spray the, the seawater over them and knock it off. So it's a mechanical knockoff. You're constantly out there uh, splitting bags, tending bags. Um, and the season, depending on the farmer, can, can be all year long. You, if you're farming oysters, there are no limit restrictions at the state setting. You determine the size you want to sell them at. You determine when you want to do it. Personally, I don't cut through ice um, to get out to my farm. I'm usually pretty burned out by December, so I take, you know, typically take January and February off. But you know, we'll be out there trying to get those harvests right you know, up into New Year's Eve. It's all, uh, we'll sort everything on the bay. Um, so it's like part-time crew, large, you know, part-time crews, uh, a lot of hands, a lot of labor involved. Okay, typically harvest is at one and a half to three years old, but with every stock you have fast growers and slow growers, just like children. Um, so part, you know, part of your maintenance is just trying to pull off the, the fast growers as they grow and make sure they don't grow out of your market size because there are market preferences. You know, people I think are moving toward liking that smaller cocktail oyster um, is it's, um, uh, preferred by, a, you know, a large number of consumers are just like easier, more delicate, so. 
And that was one of the problems that happened during the pandemic when the market dropped out immediately with the restaurant closures. There was this worry that the oysters were going to grow out of the market size. They're taking up space on the farm, and you can't cycle your gear, right? Mm. So it was, a bit, it was a big deal to try and move that product. Again, farming, uh, you're controlling a lot of, of how they're looking. Very pretty oysters, very high quality. You can provide a very uniform product that, you know, the restaurants really, really dig. And consumers like it, too. Okay, a lot of challenges. You know, it's a young industry. We still have pests and predators, um, disease. We have this changing climate, right? I mean, it's, it's crazy. Nor'easters in May. You know, go mm. figure. We lost a whole week on the farm. Mm. Variable winter temperature, right? It's one thing to protect them from the cold, but, you know, they kind of hibernate. They go into that state of hibernation. But it's another thing when it's 70 degrees one day and then, you know, 29 mm. degrees the next. So a lot of, lot of things that we're working toward. Uh, we're still developing gear. We're trying to improve hatchery production. Um, we're, you know, we're trying to figure out spatial aspects, how we, how we um, balance uh, aquaculture use with other users of the landscape. Um, the permitting's very complex. The policy and regulations are still developing. So we're working on right to farm regulations right now, and we're trying to put through Sunday harvest to allow us to harvest as farmers on Sundays, um, which you know keeps us in that competitive edge. So blue law, um, you know, and uh, you know, why, and we're you know work skilled me. staff and labor. Why won't they allow you to work on Sunday? Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of the aquaculture regulations are coupled in with um, traditional fishery regulations. So some of that was blue law, you know? Okay. Uh, and some of it is also, um, y you know, there's, uh, there's this, like, uh, hard clams have s limited harvest, no Sunday ha harvests allowed <laughs> to protect the resource. Right. For fishery, it's a quota, uh -huh. right? It's a way to manage okay. your stocks. That doesn't apply to farming, right? But no. they're afraid that if they let oyster farmers harvest on Sundays, then recreational clamors are going to want to harvest on Sundays. And because they see farmers doing it, they're going to mm -hmm. do it. So, like, it's, it's not always rational. And it, it's... Um, you know, it's a mixed industry. We have very old-time fishermen that, you know, been in it for generations, and they're, like, they're reluctant about change and nervous about change, anxious about it. Um, there, maybe there's a little competition out there. So, but there are, these are things that, you know, New Jersey Aquaculture Association, we're trying to press forward, trying to improve and make us a competitive state. Because, you know, our restaurants want fresh product on Mondays. And if somebody else can give them fresh product on Mondays, um, they're going to get it from Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. There's no lack of competition out there. So, all right. Um, so fortunately for oyster farmers, <laughs> right, there's also this tremendous opportunity. People are turning to oysters. A lot of excitement around uh, eating oysters. High quality. It can be locally sourced. It is a sustainably produced seafood. It's one of the greenest foods produced, you know, very low impacts, um, good for the environment as we're growing them. Then there's clever branding with social media. There's a, this opportunity to get to know the farmers. Uh, you see them on social media. You see them with their kids on the farm. And it's, you know, it's really exciting. And this, this really high quality product, people are, are learning to love oysters again. So it's a great time to be an oyster farmer. Um, there's a lot, a lot of demand. I mean, I wish I, I, wish I had more oysters. Uh, I could sell them with no problem at all. One of the things that is exciting about eating oysters is this aspect of miroir, like terroir and grapes and wine. Oyster flavor is going to reflect the place it's grown. It's going to vary from place to place. So if you're eating New Jersey oysters from Barnega Bay, they're going to be like really briny, salty up front. And if you're eating Delaware Bay oysters, they're going to be a little bit sweeter with like maybe a little complex profile. So this makes it, you know, it's an opportunity to, to have an experience as you're eating oysters, right? And, and enjoy them and try different oysters. You can have a plate, you can go to an oyster house in Philadelphia, have a plate of 12 different oysters. <laughs> and, you know, from West Coast, Canada, Alabama, you know, Maine, and New Jersey. 
So it's, it's, really, it's really, really fun. It's very exciting um, to, to be part of this scene and to be, you know, appreciated. So here's just, sorry, this is an old Samuel and Sons, big seafood distributor in Philadelphia. You go onto their website any particular day, they'll have like 80 oysters in stock from all over the country and Canada. And the oysters are sold by brand name. Um, sometimes it's a place, it might be Chincoteague Bay or Delaware Bay, but often it's just a clever name. It's, you know, it's Naked Cowboy, it's Sweet Amalia, it's, um, you know, Kate May, Kate May Salts, it's, you know, uh, Sloop Point. Um, so, and they'll be uh, associated with a place where they're grown, and then there'll be a flavor profile. I'm sorry, you can't read that, and I don't have my glasses on here either, but like, for instance, you know, mild, briny flavor, uh, lettuce finish, you know, uh, high salt up front, you know, smooth, crisp, you know. So there'll be all these different profiles that, you know, restaurateurs, individuals can, can shop by. Okay. Nationally, you know, we're really, aquaculture is growing. There's a strategic plan nationally to support the growth of aquaculture, um, to create opportunity for producing food in our marine systems that isn't relying on, on fisheries, um, takes some pressure off the fisheries. It's a growing industry. Right now, oysters are at the top in terms of production. About 21% of uh, U.S. produced seafood comes from aquaculture. And in terms of global ranking, U.S. is way down low, 17th, um, nowhere near the big producers uh, in the world. Um, but you can see down the bottom, we, you know, the percentages of where uh, aquaculture products coming from. Um, there are about a thousand farms along the East Coast, probably closer to 1,500 now uh, along the East Coast and to the Gulf of Mexico that are producing oysters. Um, so NOAA is really, uh, puts a lot of money into supporting um, research around oysters. Okay, so um, we, we appreciate that economic input, the value as a food resource, um, but there's also this, this background value as ecological service, environmental benefit of wild oysters, oyster reefs, which have declined in abundance. Um, and then, and then farm-raised oysters. So just because we're, you know, we're growing oysters in cages, but that doesn't make them any less beneficial to the environment, right? In some respects, they're, they're more beneficial because it's more sustainable. We're, we're putting in and we're taking out. We're putting in and we're taking out, right? This uh, article came out uh, in February, really hot off the press. There's, you know, decades of research that have been looking at eco uh, ecological value of, of oysters. Um, you know, we, we know they filter the water, that we know they're good for nutrient cycling, we know they're good habitat. This study started to like really monetize those values and take a look globally around the world at seaweed and shellfish aquaculture um, production. They're calling it non-fed aquaculture. So apart from fin fish, which requires feed, seaweeds and shellfish do not require food inputs. So that makes them, you know, more beneficial in terms of uh, um, lower demand on, on resources and less uh, impact on the environment. So, uh, so this study shows shellfish and seaweed farming provides significant economic, economic benefits far beyond <laughs> Um, the products that are sold. So they're you know, saying it's not just that we're selling them and we're using them as a food resource. What they're doing in the environment has value. Um, so let's just uh, explore some of the things they talk about. All right, up front, we've talked about this, seafood, um, very uh, nutrient-rich food, right? Oysters are good for you. They're good to eat. People enjoy them. Um, that production supports... Um, cultural services, economic opportunities. And then, um, you know, along the lines of this, there's the farm to table movement, there's ecotourism, that helps strengthen connections of communities and local environments. So uh, all, all have, you know, value in, in and apart from ecological service. In terms of what they're doing for the environment, a biggie is the removing excess nutrients. So as filter feeders, they're able to take out particulate mar uh, matter from the water 
and assimilate it as nutrients. So those nutrients contained in the plankton, they're assimilating it. That reduces um, the bioavailability of nitrogen in the water, uh, which can in excess cause eutrophication and other you know, problems. So they're sequestering nitrogen. That's a win-win. It's, it's a good thing for the environment. This is a particularly important in areas, uh, you know, shallow estuaries where you have like, you know, fertilizer inputs that are causing these big blooms. And then, so the oysters are able to remove that um, and keep check in the environment. So they looked at 49 different estimates, these researchers, and this is an international team, um, researchers from Connecticut, Maryland. Um, they, they worked with some data from Rutgers. Um, they looked at, you know, on average about 575 pounds of nitrogen is removed per acre when you're oyster farming, which, all right, that's a kind of little bit arbitrary, but it sounds good. Um, I mean, it's not arbitrary. It's based on their research, um, but it's kind of like, what does that mean to us? Uh, it's, it's a little bit harder. But when you, you put that into, into dollars, that's like, uh, you know, a value of $1,300 to $7,000 per acre per, per year. So, you know, when you have extensive farming going on, it's, it's very good. They're looking at um, the, uh, the aspect of carbon sequestration is still a little bit up in the air because they take up carbon, but they also produce carbon. So where that balance out is requiring some more research, it really depends on how you're looking at it. All right, nice. Okay, important. So you have this uh, important aspect of providing valuable habitat. So like oyster reefs, oysters in cages and farms provide this very three-dimensional structure um, that attracts in fauna like other, like I said, the worms settle, you know, you'll have barnacles settle, sea anemones settle, all kind of critters settle onto the cages, onto the oysters. That supports uh, other, other critical animals like fin fish, crabs, commercial fish, recreational important fish. Um, all uh, the, the, the cages will provide refuge for juveniles they'll provide food resources so they're really important here you see uh, i love this image it's black sea bass uh, juveniles resting on top of an oyster cage and so this studies were where they deployed gopro cameras out into the environment on on cages and they watched hours and hours of, of footage and then documented what was there and tallied them up um, so the abundance of fish on the farms was 1.6 times higher um, compared to uh, natural habitat. Um, and they value that at $618 per acre per year uh, for commercial um, fisheries fish and 779 for recreational important species. So again, looking at these services in terms of economics, um, you know, is, it's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a game changer, and we'll see where it goes moving forward in the future. Um, Rutgers participated in this study. There you can see an oyster camera on a cage. This was in Rose Cove in the Barnegat Bay system. 21 different species were documented. It included striped bass, uh, menhaden, summer flounder, blue crabs, uh, all in rec um, commercially important. So kind of cool research there. And then there's this idea of gear and oysters, this three-dimensional structure, attenuating waves, um, stabilizing sediments, providing defense against erosion of our shorelines. So as sea level rise is happening, as we get these big coastal storms with climate change, it, you know, this attenuation uh, is, is not a bad thing. It's helpful, right? Wow. Never thought of that. OK. So looking forward, right, this is a, a quote on the study by one of the authors, Rob Jones, who's at the Nature Conservancy. Um, you know, gaining reliable economic values of these ecosystem services enables consideration of these benefits into like public policy decisions. Includes systems that might allow farmers to be compensated for ecological benefits that they provide. So, you know, there's a lot of like uh, nutrient trading, big polluters can, you know, buy credits um, for, you know, their pollution. They can do good in another area. You know, there's, there's, there's work going on to like incorporate oyster farming into this framework so that, you know, farmers might be able to be, um, get some, some 
some some money for for what their oysters are doing in the environment. All right. So back to my friend Barton Seavers. Um, so I tell you, save the world and eat an oyster. Redemption on the half shell with lemon and Tabasco. So I will support that both as a <laughs> farmer and the Aquaculture Association. Um, I'm not going to try and do this here, but we have um, the Aquaculture Association got a grant from the Nature Conservancy in Pew. Uh, it was a program to help farmers um, kind of, it was COVID-19 related kind of dig out from the impact negative impacts and what we did was we wrote a grant for twenty thousand dollars to work with a a media a video company to produce little short one minute videos about uh, oyster farming in new jersey and you can access these on youtube um, by typing in new jersey aquaculture association and they're really fun videos. Um, you know, seven farms participated, and um, you know, it's it's farmers talking about what they do. It's one talks about local oysters, one talks about sustainability, one talks about what it's like to be a farmer, um, and one talks about flavor profiles. So they're really nice. Maybe you've seen them on TV. We've been running ads and Facebook ads. Um, but yeah, please do check them out. Uh, I don't want to take more time here. I'm, I'm probably running over. Um, feel free to contact me if you you know if you ever need to get in touch. Um, the website for the association is njaquaculture.org, um, and you know I have brochures here. So I'm, I'm really, you know, again, thank you for having me. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, I have a few questions. Sure. Um, I've been here a few years, and I've seen some ice sheets come down to Delaware that were like two, three feet. Can they wipe your operations out? They can, yeah. They're, you know, it's the winter's always like hold your breath. Um, I try and um, actually dig the racks really low. We pump water and try and get them down low and get the oysters protected in the sloughs. But there have been years where, you know, there's been 70% mortality on the farm. Um, I've seen um, one year ice sheets came down and just rolled a whole bunch of racks and just tangled mm. them up. They ended up in a big, like 150 racks in a big ball <laughs> of metal. Um, so, yeah. It's okay. Uh, predators. What, what preys on um, oysters? So, cow nose rays can... Oh, can really do a number on them. Uh, oyster drills, uh, little flatworms, stylocus. Um, oh, so oyster there's oyster catchers. The birds. Will sit <laughs> oh, yeah. in the cages. I mean, <laughs> like cow nose rays don't really get to the oysters because they're in the cages. Yeah. Um, oyster catchers, they can sit in there and peck at them. Blue crabs. Really? Can eat the juveniles. Oh. Um, Cape May Canal. I go down to Higby Beach quite a lot. And along the canal, I've been finding oysters on the jetty. Is that from the, you think that's from the Rutgers breeding? It could be, yeah, very well. You healthy, know. healthy oysters too, so. Yeah, they, that could be. I mean, we also have like quite a bit of production. So oysters on farms, right, they're, they could be two years old, three years old before they go to market. So that gives them the opportunity to spawn twice. And if most of them will, you know, they'll, they'll release their gametes into the water column, they'll develop into larvae, and then they'll be circulated, mm. sloshing around, right? So they can also repopulate areas. Is that a, a indicative of a healthier uh, water column, like when you start seeing oysters in different areas? I, you know, I don't think oysters are, oysters are pretty tolerant of a wide range of conditions, poor environmental conditions included. So it's not like sort of the canary and the coal mine type thing. Okay. But healthy oyster populations will, again, contribute to a healthier environment. And my last question is, um, how do you, do you work with the FDA and how do you monitor for Hep A and? With, uh, so the FDA, so there's a, there's an interstate, Shellfish Sanitation Council, 
that uh, FDA is very involved in. There's a model ordinance that um, helps guide safe handling of shellfish uh, to avoid human illness, which is different from the oyster diseases I talked about, right? The, the human illnesses are caused by Vibrio bacteria that are in the natural, they're just natural in marine systems. Oysters are naturally taking them up. Um, and when they're in the water, they're taking them up and dumping them out. And it's, it's you know, a kind of a healthy balance. After the oysters come out of the water, if they're not handled appropriately in respect to temperature, if they're like get too warm, those bacteria can, numbers can be elevated. So, um, and that can cause human illness, right, if you're eating. So as oyster farmers, we have very, very strict regulations. One, the waters where we're growing are specially classified for shellfish harvest, monitored weekly. Um, so you wouldn't be able to grow oysters in an area that wasn't. Or you wouldn't be able to harvest, you at wouldn't least. Be able to, you could, yeah, you wouldn't. Well, we couldn't establish a farm there, and you wouldn't be able to harvest anyway. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Lisa. We, that was. We record, like, when we're harvesting, there's, a, there's like a chain of custody, like we are recording the time and the temperature of the harvest, the time and temperature at landing, the time and temperature when you get it to refrigeration, the time and temperature before it goes on your truck to deliver, the time and temperature <laughs> on the invoice when you're delivering it. So the idea is like really cover, cover. it's like a, it's not our fault, like typically, right? It's, it's, it's a, all right, it's a consumer that's gonna buy two dozen oysters and then you know, drive to the mall and run into Marshalls and pick up that either <laughs> item, whether, you know. So it, it's tricky business. And the interesting thing from the farmer perspective, we can't get insurance to protect ourselves from that. Really? Like restaurants can, but farmers, it's not, like it's an exclusion. Thank you, Lisa, that was yeah, wonderful. That was good. Thank you, Lisa, appreciate it. Uh, we have to pri prioritize our time right now. Uh, Charlotte, you want the floor for a little bit? I, I appreciate the okay. time. Thank you so much. Um, this just came up. It's a subject that the Environmental Commission has been working on for a very long time and noting as they look at all of you that actually when our mission statement is reiterated each year for the council that five of you are new. <laughs> since this particular topic was covered in the year 2018-2019. Um, so two of you were there setting mission statements during that time as applied to the Cape May City Environmental, uh, Cape May City Master Plan, the input that we gave as part of our goals. So um, I, um, going to go very quickly through this. Unfortunately, um, what I'm saying today is that about a week ago, the state master plan, environmental energy master plan came through um, since being worked on for all of these years. And we made some comments at that time and now it's asking for comments again. Um, and so let me just tell you that it's 250 pages long. And I got to look at it about a week ago. And so I made some very general, quick, brief um, observations for all of you. But backing up, to 2019, when we first were introduced to this plan, we were asked to make some comments, and those comments are indeed a part of the Cape May City Master Plan. So I'm doing a couple of things today. So um, in 2019, we wrote Cape May City's Energy Master Plan as based on the fourth National Climate Ascent assessment and uh, based on energy master plan from the state of New Jersey um, as it was known then. It is now finalized. Okay, so this particular document goes along with our city master plan. Now, 
these 250 pages, I will say that um, each topic is um, defined and elaborated upon with vig vigorous goals. Um, they include jobs creation, they include lots of background and history with moving forward to describe clean energy goals, describing scenarios and models including energy costs, to treat strategic focus on comparative models, and they elaborate on the investments for low carbon solutions. On page 59, and this thing is 250 pages, so this was a quick review for all of you, but an important one because they're looking for feedback by June the 3rd. Oh. So as a member of the green team, I am just simply trying to orient you to some of this. Um, also, contained is the transportation se sector on roads and air. Um, the types of clean power are, con are compared. Um, they uh, can coincide with Clean Energy Act of 2018. It also discusses the supply sources on page 102, the benefits and set targets. It discusses on page 111, financing the projects. It discusses on 115, wind chain supplies from state to state. It's interesting to see how they've outlined, and I do wish we have more time to show you some of this, you know, in the near, near future, but this is how they're hoping we can have more energy as we look from Virginia up the coast with turbines connected from state to state in the future. Also on a page 159, um, they're looking to have net construction, new construction to be net zero for carbon producing. They're looking to decarbonize and modernize New Jersey's energy systems. They're looking to maintain natural gas while going through this decarbonization process. They're looking for ensuring access to renewable energies um, with moderate um, income communities. They're looking for access to rooftop solar insta installations. They're looking to develop electric neighborhood vehicles for, for transportation, which is very interesting because the city has already approved two vehicles, police vehicles, which are electric. But it also says to us in this community that we have the opportunity um, to have vehicles that go around, for example, for tourists. And it may be that we'd like to have a green vehicle as soon as possible. Um, it also talks about goals for support workforce pertaining to clean energy and creating jobs in the, in the green sector. It discusses the concept, a new concept actually, of something called the Green Bank. There are two states right now that offer green banks. They would be New York and Connecticut. And they are setting the model up for the state of New Jersey. They also have uh, comparative charts explained on clean energy economy. And certainly at the end, they have conclusions and definitions. And the thing is hefty. And it's amazing as well. So I just felt that I had to bring it to you to understand that there might be time in the future 
for this to be more carefully looked at, examined, and help us in the mission that we have as green team members and environmental commission members. I was so hoping that um, Mr. Yeager would be here today too to learn about perhaps taking some of this information before council. Um, it's important and I thank you for the time. Mm -hmm. Charlotte, um, may I have the copy of the 2019 paper that you have and also will you work with me on the minutes that I can use your notes so that all the commission members can get to read about that as soon as possible? Right, and um, Meryl, also the Cape May City Environmental Commission keeps um, records of all of the mission statements and things that they've written, brochures as well, and in volumes like this through the years since 1999. And um, so this is already a part of our package in those volumes, and it's a part of the package for the city environment and city master plan as well, so. Okay. okay. So we'll include all of that in the minutes. Okay. And you wanted to submit some discussion about the Ocean Festival? Yeah. Ocean Festival. Ocean Festival. Sure. Um, well, I've got a flyer here. Uh, the event is coming together, and again, it's a, a smaller festival, um, but there has been a lot of buzz, and I know it's sharing, being shared on social media. People know about it. Um, there, it will start with a family yoga flow class beginning of the day, um, right at 10 o'clock. Um, and then we've got a lineup of various environmental organizations, at least a handful that will be there, and some that cannot be there but are providing materials and handouts. Um, there, I think, are nine ocean-inspired artists that will be um, on hand. The Nature Center will be doing some free classes like what we typically do, our Horseshoe Crab Lab and um, Harbor Safari will be offered for free for the day. We have an author um, who has written a book on, on called Crab Moon about horseshoe crabs. Um, we'll be there. She did a children's book. So it's turning into a nice day. Um, we do have a beer garden by Mud Hen Brewery. So the idea of that is that people can come and hang out and, um, you know, and you know, stay for a while. And the kids can play and do activities. Um, we <coughs> do have empanada mama, so we will have some food. Um, and again, this is the first year of the event. We're looking at it as uh, a first year and kind of building upon that. We'll be doing a beach cleanup also that morning. Um, so it, I think it's turning into a nice event. Do we have a table there? The, yes. We Can I do, do? Yeah. Okay. actually. And um, so Hope and I have been working on it. We're going to do a little collaborative um, presentation between the commission and the garden club. Um, but if anyone would like to come help at the table the day of it would be great. I, I volunteered okay. we're hoping to we're hoping to have samples of uh, or photographs of the dirty dozen oh um, I'm going to try if I get my camera fixed to go around town and take really some good close-ups and maybe have some dramatic pictures of bad stuff and then um, looking to find see if we can find some seedlings uh, to give away for substitute I'm not sure that we can go that far but that's what we're Trying. Maybe yeah. seeds. Seeds are or easier. Seeds, that's a good seeds idea. are easier than seeds. Okay, um, that's the plan. <laughs> I would I would like to contact Anjek. They have um, oh their literature, of course, is amazing, but they also have games that um, we used years ago, probably at a Harbor Fest, 
and it brought the kids in, which brought their parents in. That would be, and you, yeah, that'd be great. One of them is, you. there's a question of how can you conserve water? And one little boy said, you can turn the water off while you're brushing your teeth. And I got a bunch of um, gifts from the dollar store. So he got, he got a gift. I'd like to do that. Please do. Okay. So far, um, I have organized a little like, station where kids with their parents can make all natural, chemical-free um, pesticides, and mm -hmm. I've gotten supplies mm -hmm. donated, oh, and just little bottles. They can take them home. And then um, a science teacher is going to do a demonstration on what reverse osmosis is, because that's how the desal plant works. Right. Like, oh, obviously, wonderful. the traditional science classroom uh, demonstration yeah. it requires an egg, and it takes 48 hours. Um, so it won't be <laughs> anything won't do that. like that. It'll be very dumbed down, but we're <laughs> yeah. hoping that that will then trigger a discussion about water conservation. Um, so trying mm -hmm. to like wrap in a lot of the ordinances and policies that we have in a mm -hmm. fun way. So yeah. anything, you know, okay. it's great. I'll be there for we'll, comic we'll be relief. Together. We have some Thank garden you. club. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and we have some garden club people coming too who will staff during the day. Oh good. Also we've worked out the, um, we have a radio broadcast team together. So. Now we just have to figure out the technology. So we're, we will be broadcasting and recording a lot of the programs. Okay. Did we uh, satisfy all our financial stuff with that? Do we have anything else to do? Um, it, the check will be cut in June after the June board meeting. But I so we're not we're not holding up anything up on that as a mm, committee. No, I mean we are list. Uh, the city environmental commission is listed as a sponsor. Okay. The check may arrive okay. a little late right. that's okay <laughs> and i would just if you want get on get our list of uh, and just email everybody again for help if you need it sure yeah. so just sometimes so you, you do need that list, list. Yeah. okay right yeah. and then um meryl uh, we should probably just make a decision on this okay. we're going to run that yeah whatever you all oh i like that we decide yeah. i mean look this was the original the one with the leaves the photograph on it um actually incorporated Charlotte's suggestion, which was to include the Cape May tree city information. The other one does not have it. Now, did we, uh, refresh my memory, did we decide how often or what we were gonna do, where we were gonna put this, that kind of stuff as far as the newspaper goes? Uh, yeah. We didn't deal with costs? We don't have I did not get a quote from the newspaper. Um, well, the price for last time was $291 but it doesn't have to be that big. Do we want to put one in about the Ocean Festival for this? I think they should run it. I think that if you tech. if you send it, let me think, events at um, Star and Wave or the Herald, you, well, we've, they'll just We've list been it. doing some of that to yeah. get it in like the- They'll things, just list it. Things like See and Do and-, right. and the online calendars, mm -hmm. um, yep. ads can add up, yeah, and, yeah, and can. but I can, I wrote myself a note about sending, and like we have to do it today, um, asking if they would do it as a public service announcement. Yes. Yeah. Um, Exit yes. Zero, yep. Star and Wave, the Herald, the Herald will not. Oh, they <laughs> will never. You're gonna have to pay, Oh, definitely. Everything. And yet that's the, I think that's the paper most people read. Wow. Yeah. I think they charge for it. Yeah, right, I guess. The Gazette, the little oh, right. they they or, will take anything. They're great. Or the um shoppy. Yeah. I think the word is out. Oh, and, good. and okay. um yeah, it's being shared in like the New Jersey Campground Association oh, and good. Oh, good. you know I dropped off probably twenty flyers. Did we talk about this? And it's, I picked up more what? yesterday. Yeah, I have some more if anybody wants some yeah, flyers. Running, it's I also running as on the WCFA website we, and then listen, we have I, some is, announcements. This is real important. Do we yeah. wanna can we talk about this oh, yeah, in the right. next meeting or is this something we wanna get done right away? I mean, I think we should just decide and go with it. I think yeah, let's just go with it. Let's just All right, now we're what Bring it up. Um, what do we want to do with it? I move oh. that we place one or both of those well, they're, ads. They're the same. The but they're a little oh, bit, okay. And I think there's some favoritism for one of these. Yeah, that's prettier. Out, okay. All right. So one of these. Use the one in your hand. Right. And, and right. We, okay. Where do we'll we want to put it? We'll have to pay for an ad, won't we? I yes. mean, that's a. And how so many times to, and where we want to put it? 
Oh, Kate, when is the when's Kate the May Star and Wave once a month? I was well, just going to say exactly that. How about okay. once a month in the Star and Wave through the summer? Why don't we get a quote? That, and yes. then first, first get a quote. <laughs> All right. You want me to get please a quote? Yeah. And we can make it a little smaller. Uh, a quarter. What? That's a half a quarter page. page. So you want a quarter? How page? about a quarter page? It could be readable without being too small. Right. A quarter page color, if possible, because yeah. yeah. it'll pop. If you're it's right. black and white, people you're right. will probably I know. You're right. the yeah, whole the thing green will go and yellow. Away. Okay. Will pop. Can the um, yeah yeah? And I like to a um, couple things. I'll investigate. You know, we run ads in this week in Cape May that Mac produces about what's going on. I can ask if they would run that for free. Oh please. Um, if you send digital copies of this then okay. it, it can be put out on social media. Um, Send the uh, PDF. That actually reminds me, so I had um, thought about what a social media account for the commission would look like as a way to blast the information, educational information about the ordinances out. And I asked um, Zach Mullick about it, and he said, sure, go ahead and do it. And he would check with, um, the city manager, but he didn't anticipate it being a problem. I told him I would bring it up at the next meeting. I don't know who the IT guy is with the city anymore. With Dan, the, Dan oh, left. Did he? I didn't realize. Dan's not here. He said oh, to, that Dan it would be fine. Me. No, I know that's what but I'm saying. So I don't know who to. I don't know who to we bring. Don't know it who up to, to add? Right. I saw people oh. hosing and power washing their sidewalks last weekend. Uh -oh. like Long-term residents, like they people don't know about these ordinances and policies, even people that we think do know about them. And so we've, here's, I think, I mean, we've tried to get it out. I don't even know we, that people that have their water, their lawns watered on a timer. Yeah. They have got to stop watering when it's raining. Yeah. Yeah. Or the day after. Yeah, yeah. They're supposed to have that sh automatic shut off. The systems I know. are supposed to include rain detectors and half right. of them do not. Right. So, Mac, so social media here's what I want. Waters all the time. Yeah. I would talk to Lou Belasco. Lou Belasco is our deputy manager. Okay. And he's really IT savvy. Oh, is he? Yeah. Oh, good. And I would, and good. Not the, not, I mean, I don't know Mike that well, but I know Lou, and Lou would, mm -hmm. Lou would really get into this. For okay. Me. So I'll do a little bit more research on that, but no one is opposed to no, having not at all. an Instagram account for the commission. <coughs> no, it'd be a good idea. Blasting the city with information yeah. about this. In just and Instagram? Would, that would be right up his alley. I don't have a Facebook account. I, okay. I don't know how to use Facebook. Uh, um, that's so all I do have. I'm again, just thinking more people finalize. might need more. So, Meryl, you're going to try and get an idea for a quarter page costs with color. In color. Wherever we had, we had three or four ideas. Star, Star wave. Send is that everyone the PDF of that? Okay. So that you can also send it out. If you can also save it as a JPEG file and PDF, and I mean I do do Facebook, and I'm part of a bunch of local groups, mainly because of work. But things there's one that's called like Cape May vicinity homeowners and residents. Yeah. Great. I share things with that group a lot. Um, what about next door neighbors? You, I don't know Cape if I'm a part cool. of that one. Yeah, cool Cape, so yeah, cool Cape May. All cool of Cape those. So that's that brings how you, it up to me: is are we going to be money well spent to do this, or are we going to get it filtered enough out with all the other uh, what we're just talking about? Let's investigate. Okay. As Justine just said, like money. a quote for okay, yeah. a package, right. and also you you out, you always ask for the nonprofit rate or the public service. Sometimes they just have. They have to fill, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. They have filler. They, mm -hmm. um, they used to do things like that. Um, but years ago, Charlotte remembers they used to do like water conservation right. tips, and I don't believe that cost us to put those little tips in. It was just in. Yeah. In. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, That's been an exit zero, I think. Exit zero. We um, used to send public service messages so from us, and they were free. They're yeah. Free. PSAs are free. Yeah. You're going to send Gretchen and you electronic and, and PDF and, and JPEG. Mm -hmm. And yeah. also to me, and we can put it on the WCFA website. Just send, send it to everybody. To everyone. Yeah. Okay. You don't want it. That makes it easy. Okay. The only thing we haven't done anything with is approve the minutes. Oh, we forgot, right. didn't we? Is there a motion to approve the minutes? 
I make a motion to approve last month's Second. minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And now we can adjourn. Uh, just a minute. Oh. Please, I have a request. Um, my family from California will be visiting during this, the June meeting. But if Merrill would put Hope and I on first, you know, we're not, this ordinance for invasive plants is kind of floating around. Let's get it done. I've had enough of this. Me too. Put me on first so that I can talk to you all and then go back to my family. Okay. okay? And I'm hoping Mike will be here because I, I would like to impress upon him, take the ordinance that we decided was the best and present it to the council. And please tell us when that will be presented and we can go. We can answer questions, whatever. It's but done. I want to get this done. It's done. It's ready to go. So many months. You sent me copies of something and I've been sending you emails back and forth because I had an issue with my email and I don't have the oh. files that you sent to me. So what do I do? <laughs> so you have to send them to me again. I asked oh, okay. hope that she had them. And she I did. I thought I sent them to you. I then. thought I did too. I will send you the ordinance that the two of us, the version that we agreed upon, and you can send it out to everybody. And somebody in here, or many of you in here, asked for examples of other ordinances. That's what I sent you this morning. What I want to know is what you're going to propose. Mm -hmm. Get it? That's the one like. Well, that we have. All right, but then we were going to compare it to the others to see exactly whether, I sent, if we could improve it or not. I sent Merrill. Um, All right, we didn't get it. Oh. Yeah, well, I sent her the old, the one that they uh, declined, the newest one, and then a little blurb on what the difference is between them. You sent that to me today? I did. Then no, I not today. Turn around not today. Okay. Last month. Send it to me okay. today. Send it again at my turn it And some it ordinances out. that are already in effect, if you want to read them to compare it. I know you're hot to trot on this. I am. Yeah. I, it's <laughs> been years, literally it's been years. A long time you want to get it voted down again? We No, well, you don't. No, so, you don't. But so Mike, we, we have to make this. sure we do this correctly. But we okay? did it but and we, we brought it here two or three sessions ago. Okay, but this, And it just like you said we got to we, the, the, we got to crawl with before the we right. But the decline was without comment. And we so we really we, didn't know why they declined. We fixed that so part. We it fixed something somebody it was it was a concern with an invasion of private property oh right and it was a concern with who has the authority to report what to whom and we fixed that we said a view from the sidewalk only only and that member this is proposed and it may be legally impossible that members of the environmental commission will have the authority to report to somebody else in the city about this and so that it can be then be handled the official enforcer we the have code enforcement enforcer. right and that was, those were the primary objections, and, and we did address them, and we actually discussed it. I don't even, it was. We did. And we've, we have, and we can do it again. We have had other similar regulations. Some are way too wordy, and many of them are quite similar. And none of the others actually address that privacy issue. Uh, but that was the main, main objection here, and we did fix that. So we'll, we can send it out again. I will send out sure. all of it to Merrill. And, and I'll ask her to, to read receipts so that I know. Yeah. Right, that the commission should read. We can have this on a table somewhere. Uh, at the second. I. Oh, this goes inside. Thank you. You're welcome. But I didn't say the F word. <laughs> I didn't say the F word. 